So hello everybody, thank you very much for coming to our penultimate CATS seminar talk. Uh, today, we're going to have a discussion led by Dr. Chris Wilson at McMaster University discussing ALMA or the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. Um, so over her very uh, impressive career, Dr. Wilson has been using a multi-wavelength approach uh, and particularly she's been using optical and radio telescopes such as a sub-millimeter array, the James Clark Maxwell Telescope in the Herschel Space Observatory. And from 2013 to 2014, she was on research leave at ALMA. Uh, she is truly an expert on ALMA. And in fact, she was the project, the Canadian project scientist from 1999 to 2014. Uh, so with that, thank you very much for being here today, Dr. Wilson. Uh, we look very much forward to your talk and I will leave the floor to you. All right, well, thank you, Rhea, for that, uh, Carter, sorry. <laughs> Long busy day. Thank you, Carter, for that kind introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be here to be able to talk to you about ALMA. Um, I'm going to say it's been kind of a busy and stressful month for me just with um, work commitments and things. So this talk is, um, I, I, hope, I hope it will work well. It is, it is pulled together from pieces of other talks that I have given on ALMA over the years. And so uh, hopefully it will hit the right level, but I'm, I'm very happy to take uh, questions and, and interruptions as we go along or to take more questions at the end. So yeah, feel free to, um, if you have questions, either unmute or if you put it in the chat, then, then Carter or someone will have to let me know because I can't see the chat easily while I'm, uh, while I'm talking. Okay, so uh, an outline of my talk today the slides will advance. Yep. So um, I've got, I'm going to start off with a little bit of an overview of what types of emission processes are we looking at when we look at sky at submillimeter wavelengths, because that may not be familiar to all of you. Then I'm going to focus the main part of my talk on ALMA, which is a very high sensitivity, very high resolution, powerful telescope for observing the, the millimeter and submillimeter sky. I'm then going to give you a variety of science highlights from ALMA with a mixture of kind of greatest hits, as well as um, Canadian results, um, and also a bit of results from my own um, students and my own work. And then at the end, I'll talk a little bit about how you could go actually go about uh, observing with ALMA or using ALMA data should you be interested. Um, and I've just highlighted there the various sources of my own uh, and others' uh, research support. So one of the, the, the millimeter and, and infrared part of the spectrum, um, it may, is not so familiar to people who aren't specialists in this area, but it is an important part of the overall energy budget of the universe. So this figure taken from Dole et al. 2006 shows you um, the, the flux per unit solid angle as a function of wavelength in the universe. Uh, and so um, the cosmic microwave background, of course, dominates the total energy budget. Um, but if you'd like to study individual objects, individual structures, um, the microwave background is, is only useful in some specific cases. So we look in the, at other wavelengths and you can see that the energy uh, distribution is roughly equally split between optical to say mid infrared wavelengths at 10 microns and from 10 microns to one millimeter in the far infrared and submillimeter. Um, so in this uh, wave, so this is the, um, uh, the, the wavelength range where the uh, far infrared um, dominates and the wavelength range that ALMA covers specifically is highlighted by the red shaded box. So you can see that ALMA measures the, um, the long wavelength tail of the infrared um, distribution of light uh, and, and pushes close to the peak, depending on how cold your emitting objects are. So the photons in the infrared and the submillimeter dominate the spectra of objects that are cool. And so they dominate the spectra of many high redshift galaxies. They dominate the spectra of uh, young stars and star forming regions. And they also can dominate the spectra of, of planets and even perhaps very young planets around other stars might be visible with telescopes like ALMA. So 
the there are two main um, processes that produce inf uh, emission at far infrared and submillimeter wavelengths. And the first is a continue are continuum processes that produce thermal emission. And the most commonly viewed type of thermal emission with telescopes like ALMA is thermal emission from dust. So dust grains in the interstellar medium produce a modified black body spectrum of radiation that we can observe with telescopes like ALMA. Um, the dust grains are very cold, typically 10 to 50 Kelvin, unless the interstellar medium has been shocked, in which case the temperatures can get higher. And so at these temperatures, it means the, the peak of the emission moves down towards a wavelength of um, several hundred microns. So this emission uh, is, is very bright, and it's actually very important for observing galaxies at high redshift because um, as you go to a galaxy at high redshift, the peak of the spectrum shifts into longer wavelengths, and so you move up the spectral energy distribution even though you're moving to objects further away. So this has the interesting effect with ALMA that was uh, in similar telescopes, which was noted before ALMA was built, that high redshift objects will be roughly the same flux um, no matter whether they're at a redshift of say one to about 10 because of the fact that you move up um, the spectral energy distribution here. Now there's a second thermal emission process that I want to highlight, which is a little less, less well known. And this is the radio free free emission from ionized gas. So this is produced by electrons um, scattering off of other electrons in ionized gas around H2 regions. Um, and so this is a way that we can trace the star formation rate in nearby galaxies. It's a very similar process to say measuring the H alpha emission line. Um, we are less sensitive to a given star formation rate per unit area in free free emission than we are in H alpha in a typical galaxy. But if you are studying very, very dusty galaxies, which is one of the things that uh, my research group has been concentrating on lately, it's absolutely essential because it gives us a, a, a view of the star formation rate that is not affected by the, by the large amounts of dust extinction that are present. So when you observe objects with ALMA, and if you're thinking about the continuum, these are the two primary processes that you might be observing. The other um, observation, type of observations you can do with ALMA is spectroscopy. And at the wavelengths that ALMA observes, these are primarily emission lines from molecules. And specifically, they are primarily emission lines from rotational uh, lines. There are some uh, vibrational lines or, or mixture of rotational vibrational lines you can observe with ALMA, but to first order, most everything ALMA observes is a rotational transition. So, um, Molecular gas um, in our own and other galaxies occurs when the density of the interstellar medium gets high enough uh, and the gas is shielded enough from ultraviolet radiation that molecular hydrogen can form from atomic hydrogen. Um, and in um, the central parts of most galaxies, molecular hydrogen is more abundant than atomic hydrogen. Uh, however, we can't observe molecular hydrogen directly under most circumstances because since it's a symmetric molecule, uh, it can produce a J equals one to zero emission line. The lowest emission line is a J equals two to zero. And that lowest, emission, lowest energy emission line lies at a wavelength of 25 microns in a part of the spectrum where the Earth's atmosphere is not transparent. So we can't, and it requires gas at dense at temperatures of uh, 100 to a few hundred Kelvin in order to be um, to be collisionally excited. So we can only see molecular hydrogen emission lines directly in unusual um, conditions of the interstellar medium. So rather than observing molecular hydrogen directly, we uh, use rarer molecules as tracers of the gas. And this also allows us to not only do um, astrophysics by studying the dynamics and kinematics of the gas, but we can also do astrochemistry by studying many different molecules and trying to stitch them together. So the most commonly used molecule as a tracer of the bulk molecular gas is carbon monoxide. Um, and a commonly, another commonly used trace molecule to look at denser gas is hydrogen cyanide, HCN. 
So with that little overview of emission processes, I, I wanna tell you a little bit about ALMA and how it's constructed and how it works. So ALMA, um, when it was built, um, was arguably the first world observatory in that it included as partners all the major players, all the countries that had significant effort in astronomical research at the time. ALMA began construction in about 2003 and began taking its first science in 2013. Of course, during that period and in the following decade, China has um, developed hugely in, the, in their contributions and their effort in astronomy, and they are not part of ALMA. So you might think that ALMA was a world observatory and now is a partially world observatory because it doesn't include China. Um, ALMA has three major partners. Um, there's the North American partner, which is the US and Canada, and also a Taiwanese institution is part of the North American partnership. Then there is Europe uh, through the European Southern Observatory. And then there's in East Asia, which is Japan, Taiwan again. And I should have added, I keep forgetting to add Korea to this slide. Korea has been a partner in ALMA for several years now. ALMA is located in the Northern Desert, uh, in the Atacama Desert of Chile. And so, of course, ALMA is operated in collaboration with our Chilean hosts. It's located at an elevation of 5,000 meters in the Chilean Atacama Desert. And this high elevation serves two purposes. First of all, it gets us above about 60% of the Earth's atmosphere. And the high dry site means that there's very little water vapor in the atmosphere that is there. And water vapor is the primary limitation of being able to observe at millimeter and submillimeter wavelengths. It's the primary source of opacity in the Earth's atmosphere. ALMA has three main components. So it has an array of 50 12 meter diameter antennas that we typically refer to as the main array or the 12 meter array. It then has four additional 12 meter antennas which are used as single telescopes to essentially map the total flux on the sky of the objects that we're interested in. And then it has a third array called the Atacama Compact Array which is an array of 12 antennas that are smaller, they're seven meters in diameter. And so this combination of different telescope sizes and different observing modes means that ALMA is sensitive to the emission from the sky on all spatial scales so that it, it can recover flux from very large sources like, like the moon or the sun even, but it can also get down to very high angular resolution using the main array um, and even linked up in millimeter VLBI with the Event Horizon Telescope can get down to, uh, to essentially micro arc second resolution, if I'm remembering correctly. So ALMA is a large partnership, partly because it, it costs a lot of money to build. The total shared cost of building ALMA was 1.3 billion US dollars, US dollars as they were valued in 2006. So this is an old picture of um, the uh, what uh, the looking up towards the Alma site from the 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 two lane highway that runs south from San Pedro de Atacama to the village of Tobanao, and um, this road that you see was built specifically to access the Alma site. Um, halfway up at um, here, if you can see my my little laser pointer mouse at an elevation of nearly 3,000 meters is the operation support facility. This is where the astronomers and the technicians who are working at the site um, live and sleep and eat and have laboratories. This is where when a telescope needs repair, it is brought down from the high site to the OSF in order to be repaired. And that's because the main operation site, the AOS, where the telescopes sit, at 5,000 meters elevation, there's not a lot of oxygen. Your brain doesn't work very well. Uh, and so you, if you want to do, if you're trying to do something tricky and technically difficult, you don't want to be doing it up here if you don't have to. You really want to come down to the, um, this lower elevation. So this photo was taken fairly early in construction. Um, there is now a, uh, there's like a guardhouse facility here near the gate and more infrastructure and so on. Um, but this is essentially what 
the area around um, Alma looks like. Um, this is a close-up view of an Alma antenna. This, in fact, was the first antenna built by the European side of the partnership that was, uh, the picture is taken from 2011. Um, the diameter of this telescope is 12 meters across. It's being carried by the transporter. So one of the properties of an array of telescopes is you want to move the telescopes in close together to get a low angular resolution but high sensitivity or move them far apart to get high angular resolution. And to move the telescopes, you either need to have them on railway lines, um, uh, railway lines like the VLA does, it's a very large array in New Mexico, or you need a transporter. And so this Alma uses a transporter because of the array configuration on the site is not is on purpose, not in a, a nice regular pattern. So not connected by railway lines. So you can see the size of this transporter it is massive. You can park, uh, I think, three compact cars between the opening of the wheels. Um, in 2013, when I was down on sabbatical, I was at the OSF for a working visit when they started moving some antennas up to the high side and I got to see this transporter pick up an antenna and carry it away and head off up the road. It was really quite something to see. Canada has been involved in Alma since um, the since construction started, and so we built uh, Canada built a component of Alma. We built the receiver cartridges uh, for, that Alma uses to observe at wavelengths of three millimeters or frequencies around 100 gigahertz. So this picture shows you an image of one of the receiver cartridges. This cartridge is about a little bit less than a meter tall. Uh, I think by memory, um, and the cartridges have to be cooled down to temperatures uh, of around four degrees Kelvin. So the cartridges fit in a large cryostat. The cryostat itself is about a meter across and holds 10 receivers working at 10 different uh, wavelengths. This cartridge, uh, these cartridges were built by NRC's uh, Hertzberg Institute of Astrophysics in Victoria. Um, and major subcomponents of the receiver were contracted out to Canadian industry. And, and um, this was a, a very successful project that delivered very sensitive re receivers meeting or exceeding the, the ALMA requirements. So I wanna take a few minutes um, to show you uh, some slides illustrating how an interferometer works because using an interferometer is if you haven't used one is is a little bit different from using a single telescope. And um, these slides uh, were given to me by Dr. Allison Peck, who was at, at NRAO at the time um, and moved to Gemini and I believe is now working for the NSF in the US. Um, she presented them at the Dunlop Institution, uh, Dunlop Institute Summer Instrumentation School um, several years ago. So how does an interferometer work? We're, we're, we're using a simple diagram here where we're just looking at three telescopes to illustrate the process. So, and suppose our three telescopes are looking in a direction in the sky in which there are two sources. Um, let's call them a pair of um, quasars. So the path from uh, quasar number one, the path that the light travels from that quasar to each of the three telescopes um, is a slightly different length. And so the wavefront from this quasar arrives at each of these telescopes at slightly different times because the path is different. That arrival time is not interesting. It's really just geometry. Where are the antennas on the ground? Where is the source in the sky? So we know what the delay is and we, we in, uh, the difference in the path lengths is, and so we can introduce a delay into the electronic system to compensate and to make it so that the wavefront that left this quasar is in phase as it arrives at each of our three antennas. Once we've done that, however, our neighboring quasar in the sky, because it's not quite at the same position, even after this delay compensation, the signals will arrive at the different telescopes at slightly different times, meaning that the wavefront is slightly out of phase at the three different telescopes. And it's the difference in phase between the signal arriving from our first quasar and the signal arising from our second signal, second quasar, is the signal that we're looking for. And it's the difference in phase plus variations in the amplitude 
that allow us to make an image of this portion of the sky. So what we actually measure with a pair of antennas, um, we cross correlate the signal from the two antennas. And so the measurement we get from that cross correlation is essentially a measure, a single measurement of the Fourier transform of the pattern of the brightness on the sky. So a single measurement of the Fourier transform of the brightness on the sky is not very useful, as you can see from this illustration. So in this illustration, we imagine we have two antennas located at these two positions. And measuring the cross correlation from these two antennas corresponds to measuring a single point in Fourier space, which we give coordinates u and v. This, this space is symmetric, so in fact, we end up with two measurements flipped about the origin, but we've really only got one. This is equivalent to saying what we see on the sky is a pattern of bright and dark stripes. If you think back to first year physics, which many of you will have taken and many of you will have TA'd, this is like a giant Young's double slit experiment where the, double, the slit pattern of fringes is in two dimension by essentially expanding the peak of the fringe uh, in, the third, in the third second dimension. So if you took a slice through it like this, you would have something that would look like a Young's double slit experiment. So that's what we get in a single short integration with two antennas looking at a source and cross correlating them. We don't know anything about where the source is from this image. If I add a third antenna, I now get three baselines, three pairs of antennas. And so I end up with three measurements rather than one. And I have an overlapping pattern of these Young's double slit experiments, which is still not isolating my source very well, but we're beginning to think maybe our source lies somewhere near the center of the image. If I have eight antennas and take a snapshot, I have many more pairs of antennas, many more data points, and my image now localizes the single source right at the center of the image pretty well. If I have 16 antennas, I am getting a nice round distribution of sources, uh, of measurements, and I get a nice round source. And this was actually the distribution of antennas that Alma used in its very first year of science observations. If I take those same 16 antennas and spread them further apart, so that my, if I go back, my little, I haven't changed my, uh, I changed my scale a bit on the y-axis, so my field of view has gotten wider. Putting the antennas farther apart, the Fourier transform process means that we get a sharper image, and you can see that in the image shown here. These are still snapshot images. This is if I have 32 antennas. If you, instead of just taking a single minute integration, but you track your source for maybe eight hours, you get very good coverage of the Fourier plane and you get a very clean image of your central source. So this is why interferometric arrays want to have many antennas because we will get a better sampling of the Fourier transform of the image space if we have many antennas. Now, Alma doesn't just give us an image. Alma gives us a spectral cube. So the output of our interfer interferometric observation is a data cube where we have intensity on the sky as a function of frequency. So if any of you have worked with optical data, with um, integral field spectrographs or IFUs, things like this, the, the MANGA survey from the Sloan Digitized Sky Survey, you'll be familiar with this concept of taking data and getting a spectrum at each position in the sky. Radio astronomers have been doing this for decades. <laughs> this is how radio astronomy uh, data sets, particularly interferometers in the millimeter, work. What you get out is a spectral cube. So with a spectral cube, you get a lot more information than just the brightness on the sky. You can measure things like um, Doppler shifts. You can measure 
uh, turbulent velocities. You can measure if you've got more than one molecular emission line in your spectrum, you can measure multiple lines at once. And ALMA lets you take advantage of all those different things. So with that little overview of ALMA, I'm gonna to switch to showing you some science results. And the first one that I've picked illustrates that spectral cube nature of the ALMA data. So this is a paper from 2012, um, an observation of an evolved star, I think it was a carbon star, where the image showed that the you're looking at molecular gas in the in molecular emission from the gas the star has been ejecting um, and unexpectedly they found spiral patterns in the gas and these spiral patterns are likely produced by the evolved star having an unseen companion and so that there's orbital motion and asymmetric emission by the older star so if we look at step through the spectral cube. So what you're seeing in the movie is progressive slices through the spectral cube. You can see how the three-dimensional nature of the ALMA data is letting us see really fine details in the motions of the gas and the emission and structure of the gas that would be hard to see if all you had was a collapsed image. So in fact, the first picture that I showed was not just an integrated image of the brightness of the source on the sky. It was a slice through the center of that velocity uh, cube. So I think one of the most amazing images produced by ALMA um, in its nine years of operation uh, to date, not quite nine. No, it is more than nine. Sorry, I've lost track. We, we had a 10th anniversary last year, so uh, 10 and a bit years of operation. This image of the uh, planet forming disk around the young star HL Tau. So this image was shown in a press release in uh, November of 2014 and published in Brogan et al. the next year, 2015. What you're looking at here is the color uh, emission is showing you the, the dust that's in the protoplanetary disk. So you're looking at dust continuum emission, that first process I talked about. And that where there are little gaps, lower dark rings are places where the, um, the surface density of the gas, the material per unit area is lower at those radii away from the star. So you've got, you've got a, a circular disk that's tilted, so that's giving you the elliptical effect here. And, um, and then you, each of these rings and gaps is produced by the effects of unseen planets. I think there are more than 10 rings in this image if you counted them carefully. But we think now with better modeling that there are a handful of planets in this disk. The resolution of this image is five astronomical units, and the source is about 150 parsecs away. So the angular resolution of this image is better than you can get with the Hubble Space Telescope. Moreover, there is so much gas and dust towards this young protostar that even if HSC had the resolution to match this, it wouldn't see this object because the optical light is hidden by um, the foreground dust and gas emission. So this was a spectacular image when it came out. And then one of the first of ALMA's series of large programs um, was this one to study uh, a, a sample of about 25 uh, protoplanetary disks led by um, Sean Williams at the, at the Center for Astrophysics in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And they saw similar and quite variable morphology in their sample. So you can see beautiful rings in these galaxies. Um, you can see spiral structures like this one, you know, almost looks like a spiral galaxy. There are galaxies with a, 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 a second source, the little dot right there. There are some asymmetric features like this bright blob in the outer edge of the disk, that's real. So one of the things that ALMA has been great for, and there's been quite a lot of work done by Canadians and Canadian students in this area, is looking at protoplanetary disks to try to understand 
um, how planets are formed and, and the processes of star formation. Another highlight uh, to my mind with ALMA is using ALMA to measure the masses of the supermassive black holes inside spiral galaxies. So a lot of the work on supermassive black hole masses has been done in elliptical galaxies using velocity dispersions in the optical. Spiral galaxies are hard to study using that technique because they're not as bright and they have gas and dust, but then you can use the gas and dust and the motions of the gas in particular to actually constrain the mass of the black hole. And so this is um, a figure from a paper by uh, Onishi et al. in 2015 for the galaxy NGC 1097, showing you um, the, the data um, compared to mo three different models with no black hole mass in this one, uh, 1.4 times 10 to the 8 solar mass black hole in this one, and 7 times 10 to the 8 solar mass in this one. And by looking down at the residuals, you can see that the, there's a clear preference for uh, a black hole being there and a black hole of a, of a reasonable mass. The second of the, of the first two large projects with ALMA was uh, an ultra deep, a blind ultra deep survey at high redshift. The idea here was to stare for a long time um, at, I think the field was in the Hubble ultra deep field. Uh, I'm not exactly sure now. Um, and just image ALMA with ALMA and see what, what was found. And this figure taken from a paper by Fabian Walter et al. in 2016 is showing you three of the sources imaged in this field. Um, and you can see the spectral line emission here. This is redshifted carbon monoxide. So this is telling us how much molecular gas is inside the galaxies and um, tells us something as well about the total mass of the galaxy from the kinematics. You can see these little color snapshots and then the black and white snapshots. There is almost never a prominent visible light galaxy associated with these sources. ALMA can find sources that are not visible in, in, in visible light. So I found this slide, which is now uh, four years old, from a talk I gave at CASCA uh, um, in Victoria in 2018 about ALMA. I thought it was worth showing to this audience again, probably because many of you were not at CASCA in 2018. Canadian scientific impact with ALMA. Um, so all these numbers are as of 2018, and, and there's been a lot of good work done in the last four years, obviously. As of 2018, about 2% of all ALMA papers had Canadians, as a, had a Canadian first author. The statistic that I am really impressed with was that more than half of those Canadian first author papers were led by graduate students. The first author on more than half of those was a, were, was a graduate student. And a further four of them were led by postdocs. So I think that that's a real tribute to um, Canadians and the Canadian system in that it gives graduate students the opportunity to take the lead on um, brand new science with brand new data from what was then still quite a new telescope. Um, interestingly, at the time, the Canadian first author paper that had the highest citations had been written by a graduate student, Yasher Hazave, who is now a faculty member at, um, a, I can't remember, I think it's Montreal, University of Montreal. It might be McGill. Sorry. No, that's correct. It's uh, that's correct. Montreal. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so, really good opportunity for um, Canadians to use ALMA, and really good use of ALMA by for graduate student training. And so, I just I just wanted to highlight that. So, I'm going to show some uh, examples of uh, some of those papers and some of that work. So this is a compilation from three papers looking at disks around stars at various evolutionary stages. So um, this image with the four fields is a study of objects called proplids in, in Orion. So these are very young protoplanetary disks that seem to be being um, 
um, ablated, blown away by the ultraviolet radiation from the very bright stars that are in Orion. This was work by Rita Mann when she was a, a postdoc. Um, I think she was at NRC at the time. Uh, this sequence of slides is looking at um, a transition disk, so transitioning from um, being a protoplanetary disk to being a later phase disk, done by Ninka van der Merrill, um, showing th this, this really spectacular asymmetric emission, which was a, a, an unexpected discovery by ALMA, that I remember seeing those images in the very first ever ALMA science meeting in 20. 12, 2011, I forget when exactly, and just being blown away and saying, is that right? <laughs> Having a long talk with the authors and going, yep, that's right. Um, and then this is a somewhat later stage. This is a debris disk. So the star has settled down, but a debris disk is probably formed by comets interacting with each other. Um, this is work done by Aaron Boley, who I believe is now at uh, UBC as a faculty. Um, this is still on the, the stellar side. This is work um, by um, Alex Tedarenko. Um, I think work done when she was a grad student at the University of Alberta, but possibly published when, when she was a postdoc, um, showing using ALMA to map the interaction of uh, a jet from an X ray binary. So the X ray binary uh, sits. I think kind of in the in the middle here and is driving a jet, uh, which you can see in the white radio continuum contours. And then you've got molecular gas uh, is the the is the color and the green contour. So just an, a kind of exotic object for me that was studied with Alma. Alma has done a lot of really great work at the in the high redshift universe and some of the early work. Uh, in this area was done by the team um, from the South Pole Telescope. So the South Pole Telescope Consortium had identified a number of very dusty galaxies that from their submillimeter color appeared to be at high redshift. And they followed them up with ALMA in both continuum and spectral line um, and found that in fact, most of these were high redshift sources that were being gravitationally lensed. So the lensing was what made them bright. And what you can see in the, you can see the effect of the lensing and the continuum emission here, the contours with ALMA um, relative to the HST image. So you're seeing the lenser uh, in the grayscale and the background galaxy that's being lensed in the red contours. And so these ring structures are evidence of gravitational lensing. Another really interesting aspect of this survey was the fact that you can use ALMA to obtain redshifts of distant galaxies that are too faint in the optical to measure a redshift because ALMA has a wide enough spectral band. And so that's roughly Ill illustrated here where they show a range of frequencies and a range of spectra from the different sources. And they are all shifted so that, for example, here is a CO line, the J equals three to two transition, and it was detected in these several galaxies. And then here's the four to three line, there's the five to four line. Another work by a uh, graduate student um, that I wanted to highlight was these observations of um, a cluster of galaxies at a redshift of 4.3. So this was again, ALMA imaging, and you've got little spectra of, this, of the CO or, um, or the C2 emission from, e, well, both actually, from all the galaxies in this cluster. And one of the really interesting things about this cluster is just how massive it is at this redshift. So that if you look at a plot of cluster mass as a function of redshift, here's this cluster at a redshift of 4.3. Here are various other clusters that people have studied. And the gray swath is essentially a theoretical model for how we would expect cluster masses to change with redshift. And so you can see that it is consistent with the model, but perhaps pushing towards the high side of a cluster mass at that redshift. Hard to form something this massive this fast was the um, message that I took away from this paper. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna wanna show you some res a result from my one of my own PhD students. Um, and this is looking at the antennae galaxy. So this is, 
The antennae is a very iconic system and it's the closest major merger between two gas rich galaxies. Um, uh, Ashley Bemis and I published this paper in uh, 2019 looking at the dense gas and star formation in the antennae. So we had observations of three different molecular lines all obtained simultaneously with ALMA and those molecular gas concentrations are shown overlaid here on the optical HST image to give you a sense of orientation. So this is the center of one of the merging galaxies. This is the center of the other merging galaxy. This region has a lot of gas and dust and star formation and is for historical reasons called the overlap region. This is a plot showing you the, the contours of the dense gas HCN on a color scale 70 micron image, which provides us with a measure of the star formation rate. And when we plot the, the infrared luminosity or the star formation rate versus the HCN luminosity or the dense gas mass, the points for the antennae in orange lie very nicely with global measurements for many other galaxies measured by other researchers. If we look at this data another way by taking the ratio of the infrared to the HCN luminosity, so this is now star formation rate per unit dense gas mass, an interesting fact emerges that the nuclei of the two galaxies, although they're very bright in both infrared and gas tracers, seem to be brighter in the infrared than you might expect from their gas uh, sorry, seem to be less bright in the infrared than you might expect given their gas luminosity, suggesting that star formation is somewhat suppressed in the nuclei. And these aren't the only galaxies in which this is seen. In fact, the central molecular zone of our own Milky Way lies well below the average relation for spiral galaxies. Um, and some very recent work that I want to highlight is um, uh, a large program with ALMA that, uh, that had recently completed observing and had its first publication last year. This is led by Toby Brown, now uh, at NRC Hertzberg, but he was a postdoc with me at McMaster when he submitted this proposal. Vertigo is tracing CO in 51 spirals in the Virgo cluster. And the goal is to trace the influence of the cluster environment on the gas and the star formation. The Virgo cluster has been extremely well studied at almost all wavelengths, except in the CO emission, which traces the molecular gas. And so that was the purpose of Vertigo to, um, to fill that gap. What you're seeing here is a rotating uh, set of images where you see the CO intensity, that's the velocity field, then you see velocity dispersion, and then you see peak temperature. And this is for, I think, all 49 of the galaxies in Vertigo that, uh, where we got a detection in CO. So I want to just use the last few minutes of my talk to talk a little bit about, you have an idea and you would like ALMA data. How can you go about getting it? So one of the really nice things about ALMA is there are two ways that you can go about getting ALMA data. The first I would say is the traditional method. You write your own observing proposal. Uh, ALMA has one call for proposals each year. It typically comes out in late March. This year, it's coming out tomorrow. So I can't give you up-to-date details, but tomorrow you can go to the ALMA website and see what's up with ALMA. The proposals are typically due four weeks later. So this year proposals are due April 21st. So if you have an idea for ALMA and you want to write a proposal, you know, now's the perfect time. The second way you can get ALMA data is by going into the ALMA archive, finding the public data and using it. And this, I like both things, but I have to say the ALMA archive, you get instant gratification. If the data that you need are there and they've come out of the one year proprietary period, you can have them immediately. Whereas when you write a proposal in April, uh, you might have to wait more than a year to get your data, depending on the configuration schedule. That's even if your proposal is accepted at all, because the oversubscription rate for North America and ALMA is about four to one. So both methods have their places. 
And, but particularly for new users of Alma, having a look in the Alma archive is a really good place to start. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about both of these methods. So first of all, if you're writing your own Alma proposal, there are a lot of resources to, available to you as a new proposal. Um, there is something called the Alma Primer. This is an easy to read, roughly 20 page document talking about how Alma works and giving you some example science cases that you can think about to construct your own. There's a program called the Alma Ambassadors, and this is where student, grad students and postdocs uh, visit, univer visit universities to give introductory sessions on Alma. I don't know if we have any of these in Canada this year, but a lot of them have been done remotely, and so there may still be some that you would be able to access if you were interested. When you're actually ready to write an Alma proposal, you'll need to download the Alma Observing Tool. Uh, my friends and colleagues who are optical astronomers tell me, uh, in all honesty, it's very intimidating. I believe them because I find the HST or the JWST observing tools very intimidating. It's all a matter of what you're used to. <laughs> um, but there are a lot of experts scattered across the Canadian community, including in um, in NRC Hertzberg, who would be happy to help you out or happy to collaborate on proposals if you need technical help. And then there's the proposer's guide and the technical handbook. So starting tomorrow, this web, this URL I've got at the bottom here is kind of some of the links aren't working right now. And I think that's because they're updating them, getting them ready for tomorrow. But starting about lunchtime in Toronto or Hamilton tomorrow, uh, you should be able to get at a lot of this information if you're interested. And there is an Alma help desk that you can pose um, questions if you have specific problems. This is just a snapshot from the first page of the Alma Primer. The Alma Primer was a Canadian initiative. It was led um, by Canadian astronomers out of, um, if I remember correctly, Calgary and um, uh, NRC Hertzberg. And the idea is really meant to provide a basic introduct introduction to ALMA, what it can do, and some of the terminology and concepts. So if you never used ALMA before, I really recommend the ALMA primer. It was first written, I think we, we it was written, I think for, might've been written for cycle zero, maybe not cycle zero, but cycle one. And it's been updated every year since. So the current version is cycle eight, but there probably will be a new one released tomorrow. Um, when the call for proposal comes out. All right, Alma archival data, the other way that you can get your data. So there actually is more than one way to get at archival data for Alma. So if you work in a science area where there has been an Alma large program, so like if you're interested in protoplanetary disks or high redshift galaxies or the Virgo cluster, all the large programs are committed to delivering ready to use data products. And so you can go to the Alma website and find those data products and download them. So Vertico hasn't delivered its products yet. We are aiming for a delivery this spring, uh, I think May or June. Um, and, but for example, FANGS, which was a nearby, uh, a, another large nearby galaxy survey has delivered its data products already. So they're there if you'd like to use them. The second way that you can um, access is to go and search the full ARMA archive. Um, the way I usually do this is using the ALMA query, the archive query tool, which is the uppermost link. The lower link is a newish one. It is Jupyter Notebooks designed to help you, help you search the archive. I confess I have never used a Jupyter Notebook myself yet, although my students do, so I can't tell you how easy they are to use, but I'm sure many of you are familiar with the concept, and so I, I put it out there for you as a resource. Using the old-fashioned Alma Query tool, this screenshot shows you an example of what you might see if you do an Alma Query. So what I did to produce this query was, I put in a source name of a galaxy I was interested in. This NGC 3256 is a luminous infrared galaxy and an intense starburst about 44 megaparsecs away. And I put that source name in and I got a list of a whole bunch of Alma data. And so I thought, let me narrow this down. And so I picked 
Alma band six, which means observations around 1.3 millimeters, 230 gigahertz. And then I selected one proposal from this list. And so that proposal, that particular data set covers the area highlighted in the darker orange circles on the sky and spectrally covers the re spectral region highlighted here in orange. So you can see that it has the CO two to one line, great for tracing total molecular gas. And then it's actually got a molecule carbon sulfide, CS, five to four rotational line. And I happen to know that is a dense gas tracer. So this might be a really interesting uh, source, depending on what your science was. I can also see some other information. The angular resolution of this particular data set is uh, four arc seconds. Um, it gives me some continuum sensitivity and scrolled off. This is actually a data set from the seven meter array. So I kind of cheated in making this example. This is a project that one of my former PhD students had accepted to Alma and that one of my current PhD students or recently graduated PhD students, Nathan Brunetti has published a paper using the data. So I knew this data was here and I just thought it would be an interesting example. So this is what the Alma archive looks like if you go in uh, and look for a specific object. To give you an example of what you can do with the Alma archive, um, this is a project, this is a data set that I put together starting in, uh, in 2017, I did a query of the Alma archive and I was interested in dense gas and galaxies. So I wanted to find all the galaxies in the Alma archive where the data was public for which there were observations of carbon monoxide to give me total gas, HCN to give me dense gas, and also radio continuum to give me a star formation rate tracer. And, and once I'd sorted through the intersection of all those queries, I was left with a total of 12 galaxies, nine of which are shown here. And then there's a 10th one that Ashley was interested in, the antennae is here. So I was able to put together a data set of nine galaxies ranging from incredible starbursts to normal spirals for which all of them had all the molecules in the radio continuum that I was interested in. And one of the things that we learned from this project, which was unexpected, is that the HCN and another molecule CN track each other very well. And nobody has looked, done very much work on CN in nearby galaxies. CN you can observe at the same time as CO. And so you could get your, your total gas and your dense gas tracer at the same time. And I'm very relieved that this paper has finally been submitted by me a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it has been delayed by at least two years because of COVID and various other things that we all know have been going on for the last two years. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say today. I'm sorry, it was a little longer than I anticipated. ALMA aims to be a telescope for all astronomers who want to use it. And so please, if you're interested in ALMA, but you don't know where to start, just ask. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Wilson. I think on behalf of everybody, I can say that was extremely elucidating and interesting and certainly got me excited about using ALMA data. Um, so I would like to open the floor now for the next couple minutes that we have for any questions that anybody may have. You can either raise your hand, you could um, simply unmute yourself, or you can ask a question in the chat. So I have a question. Yes, go for it, Manik. All right, so we're trying to observe a radio galaxy um, where like the jets are about say 137 uh, arc second long, but like the full top max of the 12 meter antenna is just only 35 uh, arc second, I believe, like which is the diameter of the interferometer. So I'm wondering like, um, does it mean that like we can just only observe like a part of like the jet or with Alma or we can just basically apply for to put like all in four different regions so that we can just cover the entire 
jet, uh, you know, the region? Yeah, uh, great question. I've kind of got my, I opened the chat to try to see if someone had a question in the chat and now I can't, there we go, I got it closed. Let me go back. So you can, Alma, Alma does have a small field of view. Uh, that's, that's certainly true. But you can expand the field of view by, by linking many observations together. And so you can kind of see that in this plot. If you look at the outline of this, these, these orange uh, loops, it's not a circle, right? So this is a set of data that has, is built up of three individual ALMA pointings to, to expand the field of view a little bit. If I go back to, if I try to go back to the Vertigo, so Vertigo, uh, all these galaxies are significantly larger than the Alma field of view. And so these images are made up of mosaics of many Alma pointings. So you said your, I forget you, how long you said your galaxy was, but um, you, there used to be a limit of 150 pointings per data set, but it may have gone up. But also there's, there's at least one galaxy in here, I'm probably not gonna be able to pick it out, uh, which came from the FANG survey where it was big enough that they had to, they did one map and then they did another map and then they stitched them together. So Alma, Alma is designed to be able to cover larger areas. You just, and, and actually it's fairly easy to do in the observing tool. Um, you, you, if you put in an optical image of your galaxy, I think you can like draw a box and it can be tilted and so on. So, yeah. All right, thanks very much. Great. Thank you very much for that. Uh, so I think that that's about time for us today. Um, thank you once again, Dr. Wilson, this was really wonderful. Um, and I hope to see everybody else uh, at the final CATS talk. Um, so just thank you once again, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you.